Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Paula Duran, and I am the director for Universal Dementia Caregivers. And I am here today uh, on Thursdays. We provide conversation with caregivers or updates on uh, COVID-19 or some issue related to caregiving in general. I wanted to talk today because of calls I've received from caregivers about some challenging behaviors some of us might be ex experiencing with our loved ones living with dementia. And some of these behaviors, the loved one may or may not have dementia, but still can display the same kinds of issues. Our topics today are bathing and hallucinations. And I know if you had to give anyone, any loved one a bath, there have been some days that they did not want to cooperate. They didn't want to participate. They said they already had a bath. And why do you keep trying to put them in there? And some of them might even say you're trying to drown them um, when it comes to bathing. Uh, it's important to know that in this bathing process, not everyone has had difficulty at one time or another. Strategies works one day and sometimes they won't work the next day. Uh, so we want to spend some time talking about that. Uh, that as well as hallucinations. And with hallucinations, as you know, with dementia, and with both of these issues, dementia, um, you oftentimes may see some uh, behaviors related to hallucination, not the mid levels, stages to, to latter stages. So let's start first about bathing, and then we'll go into hallucinations. And if you have any questions, feel free, send us a note, call us later. If you want, send us a note on Facebook, we'd be happy to respond to you. So let's talk about bathing. One of the first things I think is important to talk about is to clarify, to clarify in terms of bathing, how many times a day do we believe, how many times a week do we believe our, care, our loved one with dementia needs a bath? And that's important because most of you were probably raised like me that you're supposed to have a bath every day. When we were kids, it wasn't that way, but as we became adults, um, we thought we had to have a bath every day. Um, some, some of the research are saying that, that might not be necessary with some of our seniors, that you may not have to do a formal shower or a formal bath, but you can do sponge baths if you want. And they're saying a minimum of uh, two to three baths a week is recommended. But again, you have to do what's correct for you and your loved one, because you might be dealing with some additional issues that we are not aware of. So start there by thinking through how many baths do I think my loved one should have, and that can influence your behavior. Um, and in terms of uh, some other uh, caregivers who are servicing loved ones with dementia, they say that they do them every day because it helps with the routine. And I think if that routine process is working for you, it's essential that you keep doing it. Uh, so you have to do what works in your world with your loved one, but those are just some starting recommendations and starting thoughts. Now, what might cause this resistance in terms of bathing? Uh, again, your loved one might have dementia and they might feel like they've already had a bath. Or it could be that the loved one has, um, is afraid. Uh, they just don't know what's gonna happen to them and they're afraid that maybe they'll fall. Or there might be some modesty issues. Uh, because again, because I'm older, I still deserve to be honored with the level of respect and we need to make sure that the modesty issues are addressed properly with our loved one. And again, with dementia, the confusion may be progressing to a place where they don't remember that they've actually had a shower and they don't want it. And uh, another thing I tell people all the time with people with dementia, they might not even remember what it means to have a shower um, or what water is. And we'll talk a little bit about that a little later. And because when we think of water and baths, we think of it as hygiene. That's a very reasonable, rational thought. But if I have a brain disease and my brain has de deteriorated to a place where I cannot connect to that understanding of that meaning, it, may not, it means nothing to me in that regard. And water might be pretty frightening. Imagine as some of us give baths, we start right up here, we just spray them. And the issue is, say I can't see the water because I might have vision issues. Uh, but all I know is that something's hitting against me and I don't understand it. And so we need to make sure that we are sensitive to the stage where our loved one is so that we will be, uh, as I said, sensitive to um, thinking through, maybe they're confused about water and what water means. Maybe they can't see it and not understand that something's hitting me and I can't even see what it is that's hitting me. So please keep those things in mind. Uh, but I think the way you start with the bath and those of you, I, I'd love to have you in the room so we could be talking to each other. That's coming. 
my true hope is that that's coming. Uh, hopefully very soon and God blesses us. And let me try and get this mic, this thing corrected, forgive me. Okay, that's the best I can do. Um, but we have to start by honoring the person. And I say that all the time, honor, respect them. And knowing and, and make sure they're safe. So if I have some fears about falling, make sure that um, in your prep work of preparing for the bath, that the bathroom is clear and there's nothing that I could potentially uh, fall over. Uh, being very sensitive and walking through that as a person who might have dementia or an older, an older adult. I also ask you to manage yourself. Well, what does that mean? I don't know about you, but when I was caring for my mom and dad, there were days that I had a plan on what I was supposed to accomplish that day. Uh, I was supposed to have breakfast done by this time, bath done by this time, lunch ready by this time. And there were some days they wouldn't cooperate. I had a wonderful regiment and schedule and they were supposed to live to it. You soon learn as you all have, I'm sure, is that they don't always follow that every day. So it's important that you manage yourself, that you can, even though you have lots of things you feel like you have to do, sometimes it's necessary to just see, be with them it's in the room and present. And that's more meaningful than getting the dishes washed or getting the clothes washed because the human connection is what all of us need for us to survive uh, as it, a life with some level of fulfillment. So manage yourself and remember this is more than a task. Sometimes we, we view bathing as a task and we check it off, but bathing is such an intimate thing that we can do with a person that we actually can connect to their heart and their spirit as we bathe them. Uh, some, some prep things you might do. Gather all of the tools you need in the bathroom before the loved one is brought in. It can be very frustrating. Well, oops, I forgot this. Oops, I'm gonna run out, forgot this. Meanwhile, your loved one's sitting there, and we're hopefully ensuring that they're safe but have everything in the room that you need. It's recommended to three to four towels, two to three hand washcloths, uh, because that way, as you bathe them, you can dry them off and not use the same towel on various parts of the body. Um, not only that, you can also cover the parts of the body that have been washed already. And that gets back to that modesty and honor. It's just the person's not sitting there exposed. And it also helps with the chilliness that might, they might feel. In addition to getting the towels together, make sure the bathroom is comfortable for them. And I say that with a smile because I remember some days burning up in the bathroom. I'm sweating like crazy. And the issue was the bathroom was comfortable for them. It wasn't comfortable for me. But I always had to remember this moment was not about me. The moment was about taking care of mom and dad. And many caregivers tell me the same thing. They said, I need a fan in that bathroom. I said, but the problem with the fan is that it would bring a chill to the loved one and it's their bath, not yours. So make sure that the bathroom is comfortable for them. Make sure the water is the right temperature. Most people recommend lukewarm water. And, uh, and I say right for them because our skins may be different in terms of the thickness of our skin and theirs might be thinner. Um, I always test around the feet instead of up in this area to kind of get a feel to see how, what their reaction is. Cause I'm really paying attention to them to see if indeed the water is right for them. So we're in the prep stage. And the other thing is sometimes people have, our loved ones have associations. If you and I have argued about bathing, every time you say bathing, something happens in my energy and I'm ready to fight. I don't want to take that bath. It's recommended, call it something other than a bath. Uh, uh, call it a spa day, call it a, a treatment time or something positive where what we're going to do is we're gonna, you and I are going to go together. We're going to have a spa. And it's important that your instruction, instructions are short, quick, and to the point. Um, I heard a woman once, she didn't realize she was doing it. She said, Mom, we're getting ready to take a shower. I'm going to get the towels and I'm going to bring them in the bathroom. And then we'll come back and get you. And then we'll get the water right. And in the process, oh, I got some good smelling soap and da 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 da. Heart was right but at the moment she was giving too much information. Model the behaviors. Let's help, let's lift mom up. We're gonna to go to the bathroom, we'll have our spa day. And, walk, and, and with that kind of energy and that kind of love and that kind of flow is so important. And then get in the bathroom, modeling everything you can, giving instruction very simply and directly to the loved one. So we're changing the name of it from bath, especially if I have a negative association with bath. 
We talked about providing instruction, uh, uh, very short, simple, direct statements. Uh, we also have to have you remain calm and positive because if you are a caregiver, you have experienced this. You just bathe your loved one. You assist them over to a spot where they are safe and you just kind of picking up a little bit around you and they mess up on themselves again. And you know what you have to do. You have to rebate. That's why it's at that moment that you take that really deep breath, bring it into your energy and your spirit. And when you blow out all of that frustration just comes out with it to say, if they could have handled it or managed it, they would have. And then what you might do the next time is instead of sitting in there, just kind of get them dry, put whatever padding is necessary or undergarments are necessary uh, before you start trying to clean up. The wonderful thing about this process is that there are lots of opportunities to do things over. You may not get it right the first time, you may not get it right the 70th time, but as long as your heart is right and you continue to, to focus on loving and caring for the loved one. We talked about testing the water. So the, the experts at bathing, I don't claim to be one, uh, set, recommend that you start at the top in terms of bathing them with their face, change your rag so the face is, the rag is not necessary, the body rag is not necessarily cleaning the face. Uh, and then drying the areas as you go so there's no chill that can come in on them. Um, keep them covered with the parts you aren't cleaning. As my mother used to say, hit the hot spots. Everybody out there knows what I mean. Hit the hot spots. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of time in the shower, in the tub, uh, or even in, in, in giving a bed a sponge bath. Hit the hot spots, make sure that they're clean because what you're trying to do, the concept of hygiene may no longer be prevalent for them, your loved one who might be living with dementia, but you know that you need to give them a good, good cleaning and connecting because it helps with infections, it helps with skin breakdown. You gotta get under any folds that are there necessary so you keep them nice and clean and make sure they're nice and dry at the same time. You could always play music. Music has the gift of soothing the spirit of of almost everyone. So play some soft music, have the, have the lights kind of dimmed versus these really bright lights that kind of shock you when you walk into the room. Um, and take the time to engage. So it's not just a task, but it's a moment of connecting with this person that I love. So give the process time. So if you said, I got five minutes for a bath, it's not time to do that bath. Give, it, give yourself some time um, as well as your loved one some time. And if all else fails and you can't get them to bathe because they're resisting you and you don't know what to do and you're getting flustered, hire somebody to come in and do it. There's some professionals out there that will come in and bathe your loved one. But I'm a believer that you can do it if you settle your spirit enough. And if you're not, you can even have someone like that come in, guide you through the process and train you on how to do it. Because I just don't believe a, as much as I love outside caregivers, I wanna make sure that they display the same kind of love and care that I would. And when the job is done, you've already washed me up good and you can always celebrate on your way. Once you get dressed and you sit in there and put a little extra spray on them, some cologne or perfume and kind of talk about, oh, how good you smell and celebrate them while you're celebrating yourself to say you did a good job getting that bath done. And then you say, and now there's tomorrow and the tomorrow after that. Um, I want to that's, that's a quick little start. If you have any questions on bath, please let me know. Um, I forgot to tell you at the start of this, and I really mean this from my heart, that I really appreciate caregivers. I appreciate the gift that you give. I appreciate the heart that you provide. I appreciate how hard the work is, yet your heart is still there because you love them. And I think that the love, the love can cover a whole lot of mistakes and those things you don't know, seek out and learn, ask questions. All right, let's transition real quick. And we're gonna talk about hallucinations. And let me start by saying, I'm a psychologist by training. And people knew that uh, when my mom was uh, going through her experience, her journey with, with Alzheimer's, uh, she developed what people called imaginary friends. And you know how little kids do, they have this person they talk to. And I would walk into the room and my mom would be talking to someone. And, and I would say, mom, who are you talking to? And she'd say, oh, Miss Jones or something. And I'm like, is Miss Jones nice? Oh, yes. And I said, good. Then I would greet Miss Jones and say, how are you doing, Miss Jones? And, and, and as long as Miss Jones was nice, she could stay because she was comforting my mother. The goal was to make life as pleasant and satisfactory with my mother. 
Now, if Ms. Jones started clowning and she started getting the wrong spirit with it, I had the ability to oust her from the house. And friends used to tell me, well, you're buying into your mom's delusions. I said, no, what I'm doing is I'm creating an environment where my mother feels safe, my mother feels comfortable, and I am there to support her. And uh, it's important as you think about this, one last piece before I talk about more detail about hallucinations and what might be causing them. Um, I don't think we understand enough about death and dying to really say that what someone with dementia might be experiencing in terms of seeing things and hearing things is not real for them. First of all, it is real for them. Um, I think that and sometimes it could be someone's spirit that has that, that you needed to say goodbye to um, because there are lots of unanswered questions about that. And if they have someone who left and they didn't able, weren't able to say goodbye, um, I think that, that that could be an opportunity. Who are we to say it's not? My job is to honor her or him and make sure that they're safe and that if they're the person that they see is kind, let them stay. If they're not kind, boot them out. So now let's transition to about uh, delusions in general. Um, again, I'm big on honoring the person. I'm ensuring their safety at all times. Um, I'm managing myself because there's some of us that will go in the room and mom will be talking to someone or dad will be talking to someone. And you're like, who are you talking to? Uncle John. And you know what your response might be. Uncle John died five years ago. How are you having a conversation with Uncle John? Well, that's probably true that Uncle John passed about five years ago. But what does it really matter? If you could convince them that, of which you can't, especially if I have dementia, you won't ever convince me of that. Why try to bring rational, your rational thinking into where I am on my journey with this dementia? It adds no value. It's like I, a family was arguing once. The mom said the walls were green and everybody in the house said the walls were white. Well, of course the walls were white that we all could see, but to mom, the walls were green. I told them do this. Next time mom says the walls are green says, okay, conversation's over. I just need you to start paying attention though. What are the patterns? What are they presenting that makes you say, uh, that makes them say that this person is there or the wall is a certain color. I think I'm a good detective and I'm going to look for patterns. What are the patterns I see with their delusions or the things they see or hear so that I can start figuring out what might be supporting or causing these things? So let me move forward a little bit and say that um, it's important to know that uh, delusions can occur um, from a lot of different sources. And so it's important to keep your doctor that you're connected to well informed because if they have an infection, some type of delusional behaviors can, can result. Um, UTIs, urinary tract infections, can cause so much confusion that it's amazing that they can see things or experiencing things. Um, medicines can cause um, someone to feel delusional, express or identify delusion, what we consider delusional kinds of things. But in addition to that, dehydration. So as if it's a new behavior for you, Check it out and make sure there are no medical, quote unquote, medical conditions uh, versus the progression of, of a disease, dementia in particular, uh, that is causing uh, the loved one to start seeing, seeing things and hearing things. And let me just kind of tap over on the side that they might also during this time um, start engaging with the television. If they haven't started engaging with the television, they might see things on TV, some angry stuff or some shooting and that kind of stuff gets into their spirit and they start seeing that stuff themselves. A friend of mine once told me about her mom, it was a great story, I hope she didn't mind me taking it, is that um, mom, her mom, they were watching TV uh, on Saturday night and it was you know, the gun shows and the people on the street and the drugs and the violence. And, but she took mom to church the next day. And the mom <laughs> told the pastor that her daughter had these men at the house last night and they was fighting and cussing and can on. Oh, you should have seen them, pastor. But the wonderful thing is the pastor knew this family and that mom had dementia. He kind of smiled at it and said, all right, we're gonna make sure that stuff don't happen no more. You know, just little ways of, of showing kindness. So that kind of stuff can happen. 
versus you getting embarrassed and trying to explain to everybody. It's not your place to explain to everybody. If they're interested, they'll come and talk to you. But I, I, sometimes just a little fun makes you, it makes you smile and makes the workload a little bit light. So when they start developing uh, these visions or hearing things, as I said, inform your doctor to see if it's, if it's not a medical condition that can be treated. Uh, know that it's important that you know that the visions are real for them or what the hearing is real. Validate them. Don't try and convince them that they don't see something. Again, if you do that, all you're doing is being very rational in a world that may not be rational by our definition. I believe it's rational for them within the space that they're in and I need to be more in tune with their life and their world and what they're experiencing. And then I won't continually try to pull them back into mine. So typically they're needing support and assurances and you can offer that. I mean, it's such a simple gift to give to someone. What a wonderful gift is to make someone feel comfortable to say, well, mom, you know, is there, is there anything, what can I do? Where are they? Can I talk to them? Let's talk to them together or share with them um, so that they don't feel like I'm fussing at them for seeing something. Imagine, imagine how that must feel if you start engaging with them. But the other thing you should do is survey the room. It's important when you, in my bedroom, on the back of my door, I have a, a hook and my, my robe is already on that, always on that door. So the question is, if my mom were sitting there, could she see that as a person? You know how we get startled by seeing things that, that are around our room. Survey the room and see if there's anything in the room that might be perceived as something threatening. Um, also know that if they see themselves in the mirror, they may not recognize themselves. And as a result, they may think someone's in the room after them. Well, that's simple. Cover the mirror up. There's no need. It doesn't have to be there. If it's frightening for them, cover it up. If the TV and the programs are frightening for them, change the channel, put some music on, put some game shows on, put some things on that makes them feel at peace. I ask, you could also distract them if you wanted to distract them from that moment. But please know the delusions are real for them. You don't have to stop them. If it's something painful for them, kind of distract them. I said, if there's anything good about dementia, Sometimes is that the memory doesn't last long and you can distract it and move it to something else. So if I were giving advice on how to handle hallucinations, you start by handling yourself. Everything we do starts with us because we set the tone for peace. One of the gifts that you have as a caregiver, and I truly believe it's a gift, I have the ability, you have the ability to create a world around a loved one that's at peace, that's kind, that reinforces and acknowledges them, that cares for them. And I think that's probably the most important thing. As once you made the commitment to your caregiver, you committed to supporting them, but you also committed to taking care of yourself. So it's essential that as you care for them, you care for yourself. So baths and hallucinations, both are in your control, but anytime you need help, you should ask for help. If you have any questions, on suggestions on baths or suggestions on how you handle um, delusional kinds of uh, uh, delusions of your loved one, please give us a call 248-509-4357. And it would be our pleasure and our gift to support you in any way we can as we move through this journey together. Because this is a journey and we're in it together. I can share where, where my knowledge and experiences, you can share your knowledge and experiences, and I bet you somebody learns from all of it. Thank you, I hope that was useful, and I look forward to talking to you soon.